I'm just going to quickly tell you about Greg Highwood. Um, Greg's the uh, Chief Executive and Managing Director for Fairfax Media, as you know. Uh, he was appointed to the Board of Directors at Fairfax in October 2010 and then appointed Chief Executive and Managing Director in February 2011. Uh, Greg Highwood's enjoyed a long career in the media and government. He's a Walkley Award winning journalist. Uh, he's held a number of senior management positions at Fairfax including publisher and editor-in-chief of each of the Australian Financial Review, the Sydney Morning Herald, Sun Herald and The Age. Greg also held the position of group publisher Fairfax Magazines. Greg's media career is complemented by stints in government. He was executive director of policy, and, sorry, executive director of policy and cabinet in the Victorian Premier's department between 2004 and 2006. And from 2006 to 2010, he held what I think some people might regard as being one of the best jobs in Melbourne, which was chief executive of Tourism Victoria. So I reckon that sounds like a bit of fun. Greg is a director of the Victorian Major Events Company. Without further ado, would you please make welcome Greg Highwood. Well, thanks, Matt, and thanks for the introduction. Uh, I was just going to sort of kick off with a question. I mean, how many people here have the term digital in their title? Yeah, yeah well, don't get too attached to it. Because <laughs> um, I'll, I'll talk a bit about, uh, you know, the immediate next 12 months at, at the end, but I just sort of really want to make a point about, um, uh, about technology. Um, Technology gets commoditized. You know, you have big shifts, big strategic shifts, and then you get a lot of incremental change. And the sort of incremental change that we get in a digital world is pretty profound and has been running pretty fast and will continue to run pretty fast, faster than, than previous technology changes. But um, fundamentally, it will become the technology rather than an emerging or different technology that has to be differentiated within the organisation. So if you look back at, say, Fairfax, and you look at Fairfax where we started in 1832, and we picked up a technology to do what we did, which was called printing, which at that stage was nearly 400 years old. And we continued to improve that technology, but the fundamental premise of just pounding out printed pages didn't change until the 1990s, about 1992, 1995. I mean, the technology was clearly invented the net before that. And so therefore, this new technology fundamentally changed and turned on its head the business that I was in. And I remember going to Silicon Valley in the mid-90s and seeing a group of guys show how you could use the internet to search the classifieds. And I knew that the business model had been running my company for, at that stage, 160 years was over and that we had to completely change the way in which we were doing business. And so if we, the, in the last sort of 20 years, we've seen this sort of notion of digital technology change. So to the point where, if you look at our business, only 20% of our audience engages with us in print now, 20%. 80% is on digital platforms. And so therefore the notion of having digital as a distinctive category within our business is nonsense. Because it is the business. And to have a digital this or a digital that or a digital manager of this is, is crazy because it is the business. You know, our business is fundamentally a digital business. And the transformation that we've gone on, and Jane was part of this, um, was that we had to make a call a number of years ago. And it was probably, it was pretty late in the cycle because organisations go through internal debate about how, what's structural and what's cyclical and how, what you have to keep from the past and what is the future. But we made the point that we were not no longer a newspaper company that had a digital component. We were a digital company that would produce newspapers so long as they were profitable. And there might be people who want those and they'll probably have to charge five or ten bucks for them. 
in five or ten years because it's the most expensive way of, of getting the news and information. So we actually have to completely transform our business model to, I mean, I've always said internally, we can produce newspapers standing on our heads speaking German backwards. That's, that's not the issue. The issue is what's our audience want and where we want to be. So I suppose my point is around where this is all going is that we know the technology. The technology is, is, is digital. We know the format. It's a bit like the railways. I mean, see, if you could go back, the world could only move 150 years ago as fast as a horse would walk. That's as far as you could fast as you could get anything anywhere. Then the railways came and revolutionised that. So you could move as fast as a steam engine could go. Then that, tra that absolutely transformed world trade. And then you could personalise that by the motor vehicle. So the individual had choice, which again created another revolution. So what we've seen with digital technology is the move of platforms ultimately to mobile so that Ultimately, people have a mobile technology and can take everything with them. So the only issue for us now is, as an organisation, not what the technology is. So we don't need to call anyone digital. We haven't quite got to that point, but we will. And probably pretty fast now I've mentioned it. Um, that, um, that we know the format, which is mobile. So the only issue is to make sure that the technology you've got is up to standard and that organisationally, and this is the point, you are creative enough and have your processes meshed with your creativity to get a plethora of services to your customers as quickly as possible and that will change really rapidly up and down. And that's all it is. It's a, it's a pretty simple process. And I think one of the things that has occurred is that people keep getting obsessed with the technology when the technology is not the issue. The consumer is the issue. The customer is the issue. And the beauty about this technology is that you have within your power and the power of your imagination to provide people with solutions to their problems, incredible experiences that take them out of themselves and beyond themselves, and levels of services that they really want. And in terms of our business, in terms of my media business, this is a vastly better space to be in when you have to invest $200 million in printing capacity in Melbourne and $200 million in printing capacity in Sydney just to pump out pages which was a one-way linear relationship, a push relationship rather than a pull relationship and rather than a conversation, which another mani manifestation of digital technology, social media allows us to have. So that's the point I want to make. So what's going to happen over the next 12 months? Well, basically whatever you guys figure out. It's really up to you. I don't know. I don't know. What, what do you think? If you've got a good idea, you've got the technology, you've got no barrier to entry, nothing, a few thousand bucks, and you can do whatever you want, you can create a business, you can improve your business profoundly, you can engage with the consumer, you've just got to know not just what they want, but as has been said before, you know, I think Steve Jobs said it before, once you know what they want, the consumer wants, they've already moved on. That's where imagination and creativity comes. So I think it's a really simple proposition these days. And it gets really confused with the technology. Because within the media business for years, there was this massive confusion about technology and journalism. People said, what will new the end of newspapers do to journalism? Oh, absolutely nothing. Just means that you'll look at that it on a tablet or a mobile device in digital form rather than a printed form. It's got nothing to do with the journalism, it's just, just a distribution mechanism. That's all it is. 
And if you can build a business model, I mean, there was absolute debate around the fact that, you know, that printed advertising had a higher yield than digital advertising and wasn't as fragmented. But uh, it had nothing to do with the, the notion of journalism. So what we're seeing now is this extraordinary environment where there's the technology, but massive competition too, which means that you have to be incredible. Because there's no barrier to entry, there's massive fragmentation. People can enter the market. And for organisations like us, we have to provide, you know, um, we have to provide, we can create mass audiences, but we have to really organise our business really intelligently, smartly, creatively, and to do that. So we've got, you know, we've got things coming on along the track. For us, it's very important. Streaming video on demand is very important. We're, see we're seeing within the media a lot less importance in terms of relative um, income for advertising, a lot more importance in subscription. But so we want to build and we'll be building a subscription business through the core of our business where we've got not just selling digital news but also digital entertainment streaming, maybe music streaming, maybe whatever, you know, through a single account on mobile devices and whatever the imagination that we can deliver can provide because we've got the technology. So streaming video on demand, we're going to take Netflix on, which is a big call. We're doing that with Night. Uh, Stan, as we've, as we've called it, people don't understand. I said to the guys at Nine, when they came to me with that, I said, oh, that, that means um, streaming Australia network, does it? And they went, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it could be. No, we didn't even think about that. <laughs> what it fundamentally means is it's a, it's a local, normal Australian brand to provide high quality streaming entertainment, 7,000, 8,000 hours of content on your, on your mobile device of any four, form, stick a Chromecast or an Apple TV and you can watch that anywhere, massive backlogs. That is going to be the nature of on-demand entertainment, just the, the same way as it is for music. So it's not a, it, it is an extraordinarily powerful vehicle. And you know, we look at Starbucks, Starbucks didn't work in Australia. Why? Because there was a local culture and local content, the local content being local coffee, which was better than the import. So we're going to, you know, we're going to be, we put 50 million behind that and we put, and Nine has put 50 million behind that and we're going to give it a, a real crack. Because the way we see our business is that, and we have to go through a strategic stretch in terms of the way you look at a media business. It's not just an advertising business where we deliver audience for advertisers. We provide a 360 degree marketing services solution for our clients. So it might be events, data, content, as well as traditional advertising. And then on the other side, you know, there's other businesses like a streaming video on demand business where we'll use our audience and our marketing inventory to grow other businesses because it's not simple like it used to be. We used to have oligopoly, oligopolistic, monopolistic profits. We don't have that. So we have to actually be incredibly smart in terms of the way we build new revenue streams. But, you know, as I say, it's an extraordinary world. No one's got any excuse. Um, no barriers to entry. An extraordinary technology that can engage consumers. If you're good enough at engaging consumers and you're imaginative enough You've got a great future. That's all I want to say. Thank you. We've got to see some time now for some questions to our group. Thanks for that. Um, I might kick off, and perhaps Jane one has, has one after me. But I just thought uh, I'd ask by start by asking you, Greg, uh, what what's the one thing that keeps you awake at night as you think about 2015 and your business? I don't think. Uh, uh, the consumer. It's interesting. I think I'm sure there's some calls for people you know, I saw up here on the uh, on the um, on the list. Uh, it's very interesting the way that Telstra four years ago had, had built itself a good technology base, but was lagging on every measure of consumer service 
and consumer awareness that it had internally and probably externally as well. And under David Foley has absolutely turned that around. Uh, so what keeps me up at night is this notion that we were a business that frankly thought that the consumer needed us more than we needed them. And to a degree that was probably true because there were only narrow ways in which you could get news and information and so people needed their newspaper and there weren't many other options, certainly at that level of depth. And so that built within our organisation a culture of push and a culture of, well, the consumer you know, gets what it's given. And so to turn that around to a much more consumer-based organisation, customer-based organisation, is, is the thing that is the profound challenge for us because it doesn't just happen because you need to do it and it, because the whole way your organisation thinks and works is built like that. So we've made profound changes. I mean, you know, since I've, I've been there, you know, we've gone from 12,500 people to 7,500. We've gone, we've taken a $1.8 billion cost base to 500, up uh, to 1.3, we've taken 500 million out. Um, our audiences during that have never been larger, right? So we've taken this extraordinary, we've pushed this extraordinary change to the business model, but we still have these deep cultural issues that we have to address. Hello, Greg. <laughs> 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 um, we talked a little bit about news and, and media. What's going on with the rest of the business, particularly around domain? There's been some interesting things going on there. That's a fantastic business. What, what are you seeing in the market around domain? What are you seeing with regards to the competition and how is that changing? Yeah, look, domain is an interesting business. We, um, we made a big structural change in April last year where we consolidated all our publishing businesses into one and we broke the main out of all that sort of extraordinary disruptive change around classifieds. The one area where we had a good position, or not a number one position, was in real estate. This was online. So we broke that out into a separate division. Uh, and I won't go through the rest of the structural change, but, but you know, this focus around the main was important. It, the market didn't fully understand the notion of how good the main was. If you think of the Australian real estate market, it's about 130 micro markets, right, areas. And what happens is that REA, the number one, dominates in a lot of those markets, but the main dominates in a lot of those markets too, which means that the real estate agents in those micro markets get more listings from one than the other. Right? So if you're in the eastern suburbs of Sydney, or some suburbs of Melbourne, you'll get more an agent will get more listings from the main than it will from REA, which gives you pricing power within that area. So it's not a traditional number one, number two, where it's a winner-take-all situation. So the market didn't fully understand that, and but it's starting to see that now as our, our revenues continue to rise 30% year-on-year, and our, and our market share of listings and our market share of, um, of agents becomes closer to parity to REA. So this has been an extraordinary uh, shift in, um, in valuation of Fairfax. So people are starting to understand the sheer power of that business. And while people are sort of saying, you know, will I make the transition in publishing? And there's still a market question mark over that. There's absolutely, there's, a growing understanding about how to the moment where that's going. Opportunity now for questions from the floor. So I can bring the microphone down too if you need it, but uh, just shout out might be easier and uh, here's your chance to ask Greg Highwood, CEO of Fairfax, uh, would you have a question if he's on your mind? I've just asked when you uh, introduce yourself, oh sorry, when you ask a question, you could just introduce yourself if you uh, where you from, that'd be fantastic. I think we've got Pat Pinky first go in that. Yeah, hi, Matt Pinkney from the AFL. Greg, you said that your audience is split 80-20 digital and print, but I'm wondering what your uh, revenue split is between those two. Yeah, look, it's much... Um, well, if you look in the, in the metro business now, the revenues are split more 50-50 between 
advertising and, uh, and subscription. So you're, you are seeing a change in that, which is actually good for the continuation of the newspaper because um, what we're seeing is that people are prepared to pay a lot more for their newspapers than they did in the past. In fact, the industry got it completely wrong about the, um, the way in which we priced newspapers. We, it was, they were priced fundamentally as some sort of cheap mass vehicle when in fact they're relatively bespoke. Very powerful advertising vehicle, very powerful impact, very powerful with decision making, um, the decision making community in our, in our, um, in our communities. Um, but we have to sort of take a fundamental view about what the right metric was for measuring newspapers. So we said, is circulation the right metric? Well, no, because you can, I can sell newspapers to hotels and airlines for cent and, and claim it was paid circulation. So we said, what's the readership? So we brought our production down to the level of readership. So we took this radical proposition, we wanted people to read the, who read the paper and bought it. That enabled us to put the price up substantially and really rebase the revenue mix of the newspaper. So because it's much more subscription based now and much more user pays based rather than rely on advertising, it's probably got quite a long life as, a, as an effective uh, media vehicle. In terms of our internally, that also meant that once we took a compact, because the research had been in the draw for years, saying the compact was the better for consumer experience. I actually wonder, wonder if people understand why broadsheet newspapers were invented. Well, back in about the 1840s, the British government decided to tax newspapers on the numbers of pages produced. <laughs> so they made these incredible newspapers. So it absolutely got nothing to do with quality or anything like that. Really about tax, tax avoidance, right? Um, so the more compact size is better. That enabled us then to sort of move out of those big plants in Tullamaroon and Chalora in Sydney, which were built for the peak of newspaper classifiers, which is well and truly over. And so that enabled all our, all our that was probably a hundred million dollar bottom line decision all up to um, just take the metric from circulation to, to readership and make, make all the business decisions consequence to that and, and, uh, and that's important. So you know, to, to the point is, yes, a sustainable print model for quite a while because of this very heavy subscription component to it now. Well, that's a Yes, please. Me? Yeah, go ahead. Hi, Sorry. Um, yeah. My name's Geraldine Davies. I'm marketing director of iSelect. Um, I'm just wondering, as um, I'm, I'm, I suppose I'm really keen to understand how you see your advertising model evolving. Um, I suppose as you know, marketing directors' budgets don't necessarily go up year on year. They may, may not. Yet the actual channels are continuing to grow and grow. Where I should be spending my money. Um, you know, which is a, a, a key issue for all marketers out there. Tell me a little bit how you see Yeah, it's a bit like what I was saying about circulation and readership. I mean, people say, how's the ad market? Well, it's been, how's the ad market flat? Yeah. Well, that's not, the, that's not the point. What's the marketing market like? I mean, how much are people spending on marketing? Mm -hmm. Advertising is one component of, of marketing, and that's the way we see it. We see ourselves very much now as a marketing services business around publishing a property services business around around domain. And, the, and what marketing services mean is sure there's print advertising which is great for impact. If you look at the successful newspaper groups with good brands around the world, marketers are using to go whack. You know? Not a little ad here, a little ad, whack. And it's good, it works. You're looking at you're looking at digital advertising in terms of well just your banner ads you know, pretty commoditised, but you, know, you get the creative component on top of that, you put the data on top of that, and we, we, um, we, we've built and invested in data, not just in terms of, everyone's got data, but we've invested very heavily in data analytical capability in the business to sort of shape that for, for clients. Um, content marketing is a, a clearly, or native advertising is, is an area that we're investing heavily in. So, and as well as events, now our events, business is up 30% year on year. Um, so if you sort of think of that, you think here's your client, uh, 
event, print advertising, digital advertising, data, content marketing. That's a 360 degree view of, of the client and we offer all that. Um, one ex example is Dan Murphy's where Dan Murphy's is really owning in a very big way our publications but is also transacting liquor off our good food sites. And it's doing it by actually as you drop, uh, as you look for a recipe, you'll get drop three wine options, all of which you can transact immediately and have delivered to your home before you get there. So these are the sorts of relationships that we're, we're building with, um, uh, with our advertisers, with, or with our clients. They're not advertisers anymore. You've got to, you sort of got to get, it's interesting, though, that's an absolute legacy issue, an, you know, an advertiser. In fact, they're much they're broader marketing clients. Who else has a question? Simon, go ahead, please. Hi there, Simon Chapman from Wolf. Um, I'm interested, uh, Greg, in the way you're seeing different consumption patterns and, pa um, and you know, time of day shifting, those sorts of things mm. between your tablet and your mobile, uh, and, and for that matter, paper. I mean, how are you seeing? Uh, well, James could actually answer that for me better <laughs> than I could, because she came up with the notion of what was follow the sun, wasn't follow it? The sun. Follow the sun when James was at, um, at Fairfax, which is the notion of each platform has a different. Um, a different role, so therefore people might get a newspaper at home, they then go to work, they log on, they get a newspaper, oh, but they, they get um, um, a sort of fix when they get to work when they log on, then they're constantly updating on their mobile device, and then at the end of the day, they might, as they, as um, we said, take a tablet and go to bed. Right, so you get a lot of content, <laughs> get a lot, get a lot of content off your tablet uh, in bed, which has all sorts of other consequences for population growth. Etc. <laughs> but but there's, but we do follow it. And the other interesting component of that is the content that we put into each of those devices is different. It became controversial with um, journalists. Why is the content online different? Why is there more celebrity content? or entertainment content? Well, basically because you know, the, the demographic looking at each device is different, doesn't want a different um, set of content, wants a serious content, but also wants something fun during the day that they can get engaged in. So there's no drama around that, but it is different. So we have a, a whole range of different audiences. Don't ever think and don't ever fall for the notion that young people, that there's an age issue here. The age issue is only to do with the distribution vehicle for a la paper. It's not about the journalism. Young people are as engaged in our journalism than ever before. Our audiences, say for the Sydney Morning Herald, which is the most widely read publication in this country, by far, by far, like 25% more than the Herald Sun across all platforms. Um, our audiences have never been larger in the history of the company. 182 years, the company now have never been larger and they're growing substantially. Could you just clarify around your, your native apps versus your web consumption and at a device level? Are you seeing much there? Yeah, I mean, we're seeing exactly the same movement from you know from, from web to mobile that everybody everybody does. So um, you know the you're seeing this transition, you know, paper web mobile and very much the focus around uh, around mobile devices and it only stands to it only stands to reason that, that uh, people want it like that i mean newspaper was just a sort of old-fashioned mobile device in a, in a sense you sort of carry it <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it, it will build the same function in a, in a, in a, in a somewhat less, more clunky way <laughs> I think we've got time for one more question to Greg Highwood. Anybody got a, an initial question before we go to the next speaker? Yes, please. Hi, Leanne Bruce from King Content. Mm. You mentioned native advertising earlier. Could you share what your product development cycle is or what you're looking at doing in native? Well, basically, uh, we because we have quite a range of this is a um, because we have quite a range of high profile clients that have used us over many years, we just take the view that you know, probably you do from King, which is companies have um, a multitude of, of um, 
of websites. So, you know, a bank, a major bank might have 20, 25 websites anymore. They need content for that. Um, we produce content. Um, it can be our content branded by us in an independent form, or we can manufacture it completely in terms of, in terms of their needs. Do they want to go in-house and produce that content? A lot of them try. And some, you know, with, in terms of a broader strategy like the AFL, you know, may, may decide that is part of their business and that is what they want to do. But if you, but many businesses say, actually, no, our core business is not that. As long as we can get content into our, into our sites, we will do that. And so that is what we're offering is very much part of the, the broad um, discussion. Um, sure, we're having specific content discussions with clients, but often it's in the context of a broader, deeper, more sort of 360 degree relationship. Great, thank you. We'll uh, move on to Michael Simon from the uh, AFL. Um, would you please thank Greg Highwood for his insights?